<laughs> Just stop coughing, nose. forehead. You're right. Uh, like now it's just trapped in your nasal pass- yep. passage. It's just <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Stacy <Five>. Dennis <laughs> four. <laughs> Welcome to Casuals of Runeterra, episode eight. I'm your host Ryan, here with your other host, Hedge. And that was him saying his name is Ryan and I am Hetch, if you couldn't oh tell through gosh. his choking laughter. <laughs> so, so I mean, obviously, listeners, you know, we'll, we'll reveal a bit of sausage being made here. And, you know, we drink our water, we do our sound test, get all the coughs out. But I couldn't get all the coughs out. <laughs> Just like it was making it worse and Hetch was telling me to stop coughing. So I started laughing and here we are. Um, yeah. So yeah, episode eight, we're here. Poro eggs. <laughs> housekeeping up top all right you can listen to us everywhere as usual you know youtube uh soundcloud etc uh you can follow us on twitter to keep up with the episodes when they're posted uh at podcast cor that's podcast core and then you can also send your emails to podcast core at gmail.com remember that's c-o-r uh and then please leave a link like link link follow like comment hey. You know what? That that's not a bad idea. You know, like if you got a link for your decks, yeah. you know, Hetch only oh, yeah. plays bullcrap, and he needs help. Send like I need decks. a lot of help. So I didn't send, think about that either. You can send your deck to Please. me. Please, <laughs> Please help Hetch's rating before the game goes live. You, you could even put your rank in there. Like, okay. hey, I'm only like silver two, but this is what I've been playing. I'm like, dude, that's better than what I got. Let's do this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, yeah. So please do and. So use your strong voice to support the podcast and tell a friend about us. Oh, my God. I I thought we were past this. (laughs) I I, I thought I only had to weather through Poro eggs. This is your life, all right? Um, So I'm currently playing, you know, state of the game. I'm currently playing discard aggro again. And how I end up back here is because I'm doing – so obviously the game comes out. Uh, next week officially on the 30th you know big news everybody's hype uh and everybody's trying to get their rating in the proper place because no one knows there's be like a special one-time reward um everybody's trying to get their vault grinded so i went to play uh yesterday did some grinding um close to diamond i'm in uh plat plat one and i kept hitting zed fiora decks over and over i swear i played eight in a row and I beat, you know, 60% of them. So I'm doing well, but it was very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I was playing that Avarosa deck that uh, Ma- Magwai or Magwai. Mega Magwai. Yeah, Magwai posted a while back. He said he was playing around with it. And that was pretty solid, you know, but it, was, it, it wasn't it was behaving as I wanted to against those decks. So then I ended up going to Jinx Discard Aggro to just kind of outrace those guys. And I've been doing very well with that. So nothing special, just went back to the well. I, I give you know I I've got a big old smile on my face because you know I'm I'm always the one saying I'm the aggro player yeah so hell yeah <laughs> hell yeah discard those cards baby uh, get get this mid range out of here so <laughs> so you've been telling me you've been concocting this okay, nasty I, I, foul I, <laughs> po- potion it, what yeah, is it, it you have by foul week? potion it will cause you to retch and oh, you will no. just watch your rank tank of, <laughs> I, and i'm embarrassed to talk about like how much how much time i put into this deck it is a piltover zone shadow isles oh callista hecarim ephemeral deck and oh. the i wanted to put it together because i wanted to do um a lot of the shadow isles like sacrifice shenanigans Mm -hmm. but combine it with cards like the used cask salesman which is the yeah yeah, it's the the zon card that um or the piltover card that is a three two and it summons two ephemeral zero one casks Mm -hmm. that they die and they deal one damage to everybody that is a level of flavor 
that yeah. you know, we'll probably bring him up again. That's a, it's a good flavor card. <laughs> no refunds. No refunds. <laughs> <laughs> no, no refunds. But the um, I like he he also just kind of has a natural synergy too with Callista because that's two things that die the moment that he comes into play and yeah. So when the deck works, <laughs> I look like a genius. <laughs> yesterday, specifically yesterday, I played six games in a row. Yeah. All six of them were against Bannerman decks. Oh, it, yep. So it was a Demacia X or Mono Demacia Bannerman decks. Oh, no. And I got trashed. Like every time I was, they were like two health. Yeah. Like it, it was always close, but I, I lost the race every time. Like I'm not really racing. So yeah. a, a true mid range deck is going to destroyed over, me yeah. so i lost like six games in a row said screw this <laughs> i went and played my own bannerman decks yeah. to get my dailies and then i cried <laughs> well, at least you tried at least you tried That's... now i'm sharing this deck with people so now, i'm now... sorry <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, i'm sorry <laughs> um so let's get into the main topic here Boro eggs <laughs> i'm gonna try to say it as much as i can <laughs> Because it's, it's one of my more favorite titles we've come up with. <laughs> let's, let's, um, let's get the omelet going. So we're talking about Anivia. Obviously, we're still in Freljord. We're talking about Anivia and Braum, Braum, the last two remaining champions at the moment. Uh, we did Sejuani. We did you know Ash. We did Trindamir. So here we are. So let's get into our spells. So my spell uh, for this one, you know, no surprise, is Harsh Winds. And Harsh Winds is a six-cost burst spell that frostbites two enemies right and the cost here makes sense because frostbite is a card that targets one enemy and does the same thing that costs three three plus three equals six yeah. uh, <laughs> that's the second time i've done math yeah, yeah in less than 10 episodes yeah. most card games aren't really going to give you a, like an offer of buy now and you get two for one exactly right? <laughs> <laughs> like, um this is definitely a card that's geared more towards mid-range and control variants of the deck uh, and it's a direct reference to Anivia's control of the elements of the Frail Yord, which we'll get into when we talk about her. Um, it's a good card. I mean, this card is it, it's high costed, and especially with the curve of how cost works in this game being a lot, you know, lower uh, than most games, where you know paying five for something is considered expensive. Uh, at first, you would think, okay, well, this is a very expensive spell. Why would you ever use this? Why would you play three up? Because it's always a three up usually. And that's because you have the mechanic of the three additional spell you can have leftover mana in, right? So that helps you get to this cost a lot easier, helps you set up future turns, and it definitely benefits those who play ahead of their opponent. Yeah, and I, I my favorite bit about this card is that it's just so flexible. Like this isn't this isn't one of the cards that is like if you're if you see it played, it's like okay, this is a control deck. Like it, it works mid range, like you could play this in aggro too because the ability to just like negate someone's trade, like I mean it's obviously it's like a lot of six drops you don't want to see in aggro, but it can be used as a combat trick. Yeah, it's it's like this is the all star of Frail Yard. Yeah, like, it's such a good card. Yep. Uh, and the quote here is always good. You challenged me on my own lands, you ill prepared little one. Yeah. <laughs> Nivia doesn't Nivia mix words. Uh, Nivia ain't played for a demigod. Uh, <laughs> so what do you have? Demigod. Um I I also went um a little bit out of flavor just for a card that I do enjoy which um is Avalanche. Mm -hmm. It's a 4 mana slow spell that deals 2 damage to all units. Yeah. So it's going to deal damage to um followers and champions mm -hmm. and its allies and enemies. It's just uh, avalanche doesn't care it's gonna hit everything yep um and i i think that this card is a little underutilized but it's because a lot of the frostbite mechanics are really good mm -hmm. um and one of the things that whenever i am trying to go out of my comfort zone and play control i'm yeah. most comfortable playing with board wipes mm -hmm. And there are there's one true board wipe in Rune Terra, and that's it. So, like anything that's close to a board wipe, I'm like holding it close to me, and I'm like, please don't <laughs> leave me. Um, so I love this card, and the I did want to bring it up just so that I could purposely point out that cinematic 
that oh, yeah. Ryan put out for Pharrell Yord with Braum just snowboarding down an avalanche with his shield. Yeah. Come on. That was sick. <laughs> that was so yeah, sick. There's bro. also another reference to avalanche in when we get to Braum's story and we talk about uh, him saving the troll, the troll kid. Yep. Um, and- but yeah, that's a, that's a good choice. That's a good choice. Yeah, to your point, uh, board clears are as valuable as toilet paper right now. So you want to <laughs> hold on to it and you want to wipe responsibly. Um, this will protect you from the Poro 19. <laughs> the Poro, <laughs> Poro eggs. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so now we're going to move on to followers here. And I picked one that's not really played much um, and has recently been updated to try to increase play or it may be one of those future cards. So... In card games, you tend to have developers release, developers and designers release cards ahead of schedule so that they're there for when new sets come out. And I think this is one of those for especially some of the bigger cost things we're seeing in this new expansion like Nautilus just got revealed, right? Um, And he's a high cost of thing. So who knows, right? You might need this ramp ability. So I'm talking about wording stones and I had to make sure I knew how to say it correctly. And I even put it in parentheses uh, (laughs) because I'm tired of messing up. (laughs) I'm turning my life around it. Like he's got notes everywhere. Like he mailed me a post-it so that I can have a physical, a physical write down of how to pronounce this card. So (laughs) I'm like receiving it in the mail. Like, what what the hell is this? So we've talked about <laughs> ramp in the past and talked about seeing more of it. And this is a good example of it. Uh, this one's more geared to more, towards control style of ramp. Uh, so Wording Stones is a three cost zero four that at the round start, you get an extra mana gem this round. So that's pretty straightforward. You sacrifice a turn by playing it to get a bonus the next turn of an extra mana crystal to use. And you also get a chump blocker. It's an 04. It used to be an 03 and nobody touched it, right? So it makes sense. And I could see them bumping the butt a little bit more, maybe. Who knows? Um, we'll see how it plays out once the new set comes out, people start using it. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to, I picked this one is because it's another reference uh, in the in the quote here from Ash, where it talks about the older tribes leaving this behind, like the first tribes. And those first tribes kind of popped up while Anivia went through her uh, rebirth period and she was watching over the land and seeing humans pop up for the first time. And it's the images of a cairn and not the city in Australia, but <laughs> a cairn being <laughs> essentially landmarks left by tribes or you know um, nomads to be able to have a landmark for traversing sparse areas, right? And when you're dealing with a large uh, tundra, the desolate expanse of tundra, that makes sense, right? Does anyone, like, does, from would any Aussie know what snow is? Like, <laughs> I, like we're I talking about, like, the harsh winds, frostbite and everything. Are these even words in, like, know. the vocabulary of Australian English? Australia is so <laughs> massive. Like, or, I say yeah, massive, but it's bigger than you think. I wonder if it snows anywhere. Uh, because I mean, it's it, located right there in that tropical in that belt, it, right? Like so, it's, it's south enough, right, to maybe like the most southern points. Yeah. Because like, I know, I know the uh, like for the Arctic, like Arctic ex- uh, expeditions and traveling, they go from the ports of Australia. Yeah. To get so. there, so I mean, maybe it's not that far of a drive. Well, I say Welcome drive. To- Sorry, there's water. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to two ignorant Americans. I know, right? <laughs> like. <laughs> Well, actually, no, um, one, one ignorant Cuban and one ignorant <laughs> Canadian. This is not even an American podcast. <laughs> no, you've broken the veil. <laughs> they the know veil. too much. Um, uh, but, but back to Wording Stones, yeah. I, think, I think this card is going to end up being a lot more controversial when the next set comes out because the the effect of it like it only grants you that ramped mana for the round. Yeah. So if you play it on turn three, turn four, you have five mana. And if it gets removed, turn five, you will only have five mana. You don't actually get that ramp. And the other, the other ramp cards will actually ramp. Like Mm -hmm. it's a true ramp. Whereas wording stones isn't. And one of the cards that got spoiled for for Freljord in the next set I, I don't know the name of it, and okay. I do? don't have it prepared, so I, I'm not going to try to go silent and yeah. find it. But um, it, it's a it's a minion. Uh, it's a four three with overwhelm, and it has nexus strike 
get a mana crystal. Oh yeah, like okay. it ramps you yeah, on a yeah. on a body that's actually relevant because yes. Wording Stones isn't going to be trading with anything. Yeah. So why, like, would it, this card be overpowered if it just actually truly ramped you instead of only do, giving you the mana for yeah. the turn? It seems like they're being very careful because in Magic we've seen where ramp can get out of control, and then you can't. You know, you have people using the ramp to draw cards so then they have infinite cards infinite mana on you know three turns earlier than their opponent and that's that's what i think they're trying to stay away from because it's ruined games before and it's really hard to design a comeback from that um, that's fair but now we get to talk about what we're really here for the we're the the all-star yeah. of this podcast <laughs> The only reason anyone listens to us. That's right, everyone. We're about to talk about the man, the myth, the legend himself, Cervantes. Cervantes. <laughs> so, so my, if, my if you don't know, wait, okay, wait. First of all, if you don't know who Cervantes is yet, go listen to the other podcast episodes <laughs> because Cervantes is very important. All right, Hedge, continue. Uh, Cervantes <laughs> is the reason I get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, I do do it for Cervantes. <laughs> do it for Cervantes. Um, so my my follower pick is going to be the Mighty Poro. Yeah, it's a three mana three three with overwhelm, <laughs> and he is a big old beautiful boy. Big old I, boy. <laughs> um, and like the art already is just so much fun on this card because it's a giant Poro <laughs> holding <laughs> holding Mjolnir, Mjolnir. <laughs> like each are a hard out Thor the eye patch <laughs> with an eye patch <laughs> like this it's great and if you open the full art too there's just an army of dumb looking Poros <laughs> behind him just like hey. <laughs> It's Cervantes. <laughs> like, oh, y'all thought this was a game? <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, the oh. I do. I, I think that this card is going to be seeing a lot more when Sejuani comes out. Yeah. Because of the overwhelm text, like overwhelm, and like if speaking from my old pl experience <laughs> with uh, Magic: The Gathering, like trample. Yeah. Like it's that's a big deal when it comes to like blocking and everything. It's really looking at a board and saying that I can block five creatures mm. instead of saying how much damage is there Yeah, is way different because you give everything overwhelm and all of a sudden you have to look at the numbers and you have to figure out how much of that you got to block yeah. before your life total becomes zero. So I think, I think that Mighty Poro will end up. Say, well, excuse me, Cervantes is going to be saving more play, <laughs> and the other bit with Cervantes is that he can also be spawned with Brom, yes, uh, with a leveled up Brom, which we will get into later. Like I, I he's Cervantes is going to be the star of the show <laughs> for everyone, whether they know it or not. All right, like Cervantes knows how good he is. It has been decided. <laughs> it has been, um, so it is written. Uh, so it shall be. So it shall be. The uh, so let's get into the champions. And this one, you know, mine's gonna be a little bit fast. If you haven't figured it out by now, I'm talking about Anivia. That's my choice for this week. And Anivia, not much story because she exists in the background of so many other stories. Especially as we get, because remember, there's like 148 champions or something like that in League of Legends. So as we get more, we'll start to learn more about the old gods and the environmental gods, especially when we get to, um, what is it, Udyr? Uh, when we get to that spectrum of uh, like spiritualism and et cetera. But so what is Anivia? Anivia is probably easiest to think of her. She's a demigod, right? She's kind of similar to Volibear, if you want to think about that, except she's extremely tied to the Freljord region. Like she is a part of it physically. Uh, and she's essentially an ice phoenix, right? So she goes through the whole... Um, what is it? Cycle of life, death, rebirth. Uh, and in those time frames, she's affecting the land and, you know, watching over it. So she's a force of nature. Think of it like that. Um, and one thing we get to see is that she gets to witness the, you know, all the stories we've talked about with Ash and Sejuani and the tribes, you know, them being like the third generation uh, in, a, in a long line. Anivia was around when the first generation of humans popped up. She kind of watched what was happening as it was one great tribe that then split into many smaller ones because of altercations and, you know, infighting and so on and so forth, which got you to the point that we were in Ashes and Sejuani's story. Um, and then 
turns out because she's now here, you have Ash who's trying to bring it back to where it once was as unifying all the tribes to one cause as, you know, their home as Freljord taking care of it and taking care of each other. And Anivia is all about that. She's picking a side, right? She's on the side of good. Uh, and her other job, so her par- part-time job, right? So obviously, you know, it's, it's America, so you have to have more than one job. So <laughs> <laughs> while she's helping Ash and kind of allied with Ash in her goal, she's also keeping an eye on all the, you know, chaos creatures, the Ursine references that we've heard before uh, in the background and helping with that as well. Uh, because she says something darker is looming. So that whole threat of, you remember the Frost Shamans we talked about? We talked about the Earth sign. There's more there. We'll get more as more cards come out. And we'll hear about that side of the story because there is an overarching plot in League of Legends. But we're not there yet because we still have like probably 20 more episodes to go through to get you all ca- caught up uh, just based on what's available. In yeah, the if we're talking about like getting into like the actual like full picture yeah. or what we can see of it in the 4K lore, that's, HDR well, picture. <laughs> we're going to be some old men by the time we get there. But yeah. <laughs> the um, I, I think like the, the my favorite bit about the fact that Anivia was a champion that they decided to go with with the Feral Yord mm-hmm. is how ancient she is yes. and there's it's not quite in all of the lore i think like shadow isles uh, for what we have talked about is the the deepest that we get to look into like the ancient history yeah. of rune terra and the fact that they went ahead and decided to go with anivia as one of the feral yord champions like opens the doors to really seeing all of the things that people have forgotten about with Runeterra. Yeah. And because obviously there's ties to the first humans that appeared, which would be like Lysandra, which is a champion in League of Legends. Yeah. And that does tie deeply with Anivia. So, you know, sure, that opens a door there. But even with regions like Demacia, Demacia has forgotten. Um, at least what we know of with the champions that are out, they don't remember the ancient history mm-hmm. verbatim of how their city ended up coming to be, which was the conflict between Kale and Morgana. Yeah. And the fact that Anivia is already in Rune Terra as far as being able to present that ancient history mm-hmm. it really opens a door for a lot of other champions to come into the game sooner yeah that's really which that's really well said yeah and that, that, that's cool um because it gives you that that next level of power right like in any good anime you gotta have the you gotta have the next <laughs> level right your <laughs> lagon is proven we'll take it to space um but let's look at the card real quick so anivia is a control card Control decks only, please. <laughs> All right. It's a seven cost two four. All right. It's a seven cost two four who has enlightened abilities, uh, which means, you know, when you're at 10 mana, which is controlling. Uh, her attack, she deals one damage to all enemies, and her last breath uh, revives or it turns her into an egg or egg Nivia. I don't even know why they decide. I listen. Poro egg. Poro Nivea. egg. Nivea. <laughs> <laughs> you, you read my mind. See, this, is, this is why we're doing the show. <laughs> we are one of the of the same. Um, but yeah. So when she flips, so when she flips, she deals two damage instead of one. Which at that point, you've lost the game. Nothing can really survive because she does that damage before she attacks too, and she's a three five at this point, and she turns into an egg. And when she turns into an egg at the start of the round, she transforms back into a Nivea uh, if she's enlightened. And then, so it's like, you can't, it's it's pretty much a game ender. And her, you know, if they have an extra one in hand, it turns into a harsh winds, which just made, like this card is made to, if you can get online, you win. Um, yeah. And I like, it's the, the two bodies is what makes yeah. it exhausting too. Like that, that's the biggest reason of like, okay, if it gets online, you've lost yeah. it because most of the other ones, it's like, well, if you kill it, you, you know, you have a chance. Well, can you kill this one twice? You, you're <laughs> guaranteed to be two for one yourself for a fighting chance. Yeah. That's, that's not a fighting chance. Anymore. I'm happy you mentioned that because this is probably one of the most difficult card games to deal with two for ones in um, in my in my experience, so that makes this card even more powerful. Um, yeah. But speaking of powerful, <laughs> speaking of powerful, <laughs> never fear, because Brom is here. Brom is here. <laughs> Brom is here. They uh, um, 
So my my champion is go- if it's not clear yet, it's going to be <laughs> the mustached man himself. Mustache. Like, I have a I have a going theme here. Yeah. If <laughs> but, and we're uh, both rocking mustaches for this episode because of quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, you got you got to God bless that quarantine style, you know? Like, like we could still look fly while I know, being right? lazy as hell. <laughs> but um so Brom first and foremost, the thing I want to make the most clear is this is the most wholesome story that mm-hmm. Riot gives us. If you need a smile for the day <laughs> and you haven't read through Brahms lore, just go read it. It'll put a smile on your face because God bless this man. Like uh, this is he must be protected at all costs. Protected. Don't nerf Brahm. <laughs> he must be protected. Uh but um Brahm uh, growing up, it was very clear that Brahm was going to be a very large and powerful man. Like it was very clear that he was already bigger than the children. <laughs> like Brom, Brom came out of the womb looking like he does. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the the most important thing with his childhood is that Brom was always taught by his mother that he should use his size and his power to protect those weaker than himself, not to not to bully those weaker. And his mother not only reinforced that through words, but also through her actions. So his earliest memories are of neighboring tribes because the Freljord is very a very tribal and almost nomadic land, yeah. especially when you get away from the quote unquote cities. And they're, the village that Brom grew up in, their neighbors were constantly raiding and harassing them, taking their... Uh, taking their cattle and their food and a terrible storm one night rolls in and nearly wipes that their neighboring town off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And Brahm's mother is the first person to start leading efforts to go to the survivors and bring them food and try to provide them with shelter. And that's when Brahm understood what it means to use your power for good because these people who were the enemies that he grew up knowing suddenly became family. Mm -hmm. They, they treated him with nothing but love with open arms and open hearts because of the love that his mother showed. And then that's when he decided is I'm 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 getting for (laughs) Klimt. Like that's, that's when Brom decided to become the person that he is. And then the, the biggest summation of his lore is from that point on, he became a fairy tale character. (laughs) He becomes so large that it's like, Oh, wait a second. He is clearly, he is clearly an iceborne. Yeah. And then everyone went, well, what do we do? And then Brom went, no, it's fine. I'm going on an adventure. <laughs> and no one, no one sees any of Brom's adventures. Yeah. So the rest of Brom's life is just talked over in mead halls. Yep. And it's just like, hey, did you? I heard through the grapevine that you downed an entire forest with your bare hands. Yeah. Is that true? <laughs> Don't let the truth get in the way. So meanwhile, Babbling Beard is trying to tell the truth. (laughs) And Brom is trying to deny it. Uh, The the quote that Brom, that they give Brom as far as the way that he discusses his own legend is why why use the truth to take away something that brings happiness and people together. Like I would rather I would rather live a lie than to take that happiness from people. Like Brom is just such a Dude, warm this, person. This was a great character and, when he was revealed um, oh, in yeah, League of Legends absolutely. because I, at first, I mean, you see his kit and people hated him, right? Because he's he's a very disruptive character, but it's such it's such a likable lore. It's such a different take. Like, yeah, it's a big strong guy. You have that in plenty of fantasy, but to have him be so selfless, to have him be so kind of just like joy loving. Um, and then to have him, you know, his his kind of love of Poros, right? Like that's also, like yes. it, it ele- elevated the concept of Poro culture. I can't believe I said that. It's 2020 for real. Um, Poro <laughs> culture in that community where people love Poros and want more of them, right? 
Um, and like to the point where every region that's going to be revealed has to have a Poro in it. And Riot knows that, right? Yeah. Like, it's Poros or Riot. Yeah. Like, we're, right. we're, getting or one, Riot. we're getting one or the other. All right. So if Riot doesn't want their head on the platter, we <laughs> get Poros. So let's talk about the card. You um, mentioned it earlier. This, yes. The card, the card is um, – one of the most unique champions as far as in the no card attack. game. That's cur- no attack. So he's a three mana zero five That's flavor baby. He- and his he has challenger and regenerate. Um, so this is the first champion that we've talked about that with regenerate. Um, so regenerate is the or regeneration. Excuse me. Is at the end at the end of a round or at the start of a round? Like I know the card will say at the start of each round. It's but technically, it's at the end of a round. Yeah. It's well, that the phases that are kind of yeah, the phases are kind of wonky. But the the key part is that at the start of each round, he fully restores all of his health. Which in in Rune Terra, the cards or the followers and champions work very similarly to Hearthstone, where the damage sticks. Mm-hmm. If you deal damage to a creature with four health, then that creature has to take four damage over yeah. how many turns that takes and then once he takes that four damage he dies um with a creature with regeneration they get it all back you got to kill them in one go um but with brahm he starts off with five health his level up is that he has to survive 10 damage mm-hmm. and once he survived 10 damage he gains two more health still zero attack off of his level up and then he gets the text, when I survive damage, summon Cervantes. <laughs> Cervantes! Um, or, yeah, so, um, for people who haven't, who, people who aren't truly following the game, the card will read, summon a mighty poor. Yeah! That's, and that's a typo. It's summon Cervantes. Oh, man. <laughs> it's, but, it's funny uh, because Cervantes is riding on the shoulders of Brom. And since he's your mount... You ride on Cervantes, so technically, Brom, Brom's huge. Brom's your secondary mount. It's a stack Brom. of people. It's three, <laughs> three kids in a trench coat. <laughs> it's the ultimate. I am the ultimate chicken fighter. I'm the all ultimate. right, like, like I'm, I'm a top. This giant chicken fighter. Oh man, deck. Well, yeah, Brom's awesome. Um, and let's let's. The, uh, do, sorry, was there something else? Yeah. Um, I think like the because he's a really cool card, but the part of him that is the most unique and definitely the thing that was most oppressive when the game started mm-hmm. is that his unique spell is take heart. Yeah. And take heart is a three mana burst spell that grants a damaged ally plus three plus three. Not for the round. <laughs> Permanently. Yeah. <laughs> and the I remember when I first got into the beta, the first decks that I was running into over and over again were Brom decks. Yeah. And I was sitting here going, I can't kill this thing. I of course was playing Lux. Yeah. So like my my biggest part of removal outside of damage was Purify. And I yep. just remember like the second game I ever played just hovering over a Braum with Purify going, This is bull crap. This needs to get nerfed. <laughs> I'm so cannot angry. target champion. <laughs> cannot target champion. What is this crap? And um, Braum's already pure too. So like lore wise, you you couldn't <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. But um I the last thing I'll say with the lore is because Brom also opens up a lot of doors for more Ferrior champions. Pun the same intended. Way does. <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended. I can do it too. What? How do you like that? How do you like that, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> but so Brom opens the door yeah. for a lot of other champions because he is he is heavily wanted by the Frost Guard. And the Frost Guard are the ancient humans that are under the ice that no one knows about. Mm-hmm. I think the closest thing you can compare it to from other lores uh, would be like um, a lot of northern tribes or dwarf races mm-hmm. and the drow. Yeah. Um, like I, I'm thinking more like Elder Scrolls, how the yeah. Nords have the drow. Um, Drist or the Drog. Go Yeah. So. <laughs> 
the you know there's this whole race of people or this hidden society quote unquote and they want brahm because brahm saved a troll that was locked in some ancient vault by punching his way through the mountain <laughs> to get into this to get into this this vault yeah he doesn't take anything out of the vault outside of rescuing this troll child and then because he was pissed that he had to punch his way through the mountain, he ripped the vault door off its hinges. And it turns out that the vault door has true ice in it. Yep. And that is the shield that we all know Brom for carrying around. Mm -hmm. And so just that story of how he gets his shield just ties in, like, you know, Lysandra the same way that yeah. Anivia ties in Lysandra. Like, why... It's like, why Why are they so obsessed with this vault door? Yeah. Who was the troll kid that he saved? Yeah. Why does yeah. Why does the troll king c c Trundle care about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and... And Brom ends up, like... And I love, I love this, because Brom does end up helping the Averosans yeah. because he wants, he, he views the Frail Yord as a big family. So obviously he's going to fight for the people that kind of want to bring it together, yeah. but he doesn't want to fight. He just is going to like, I'll keep your people safe. Yeah. I'm not going to fight though. Uh, but my favorite bit of that is that it's rumored that he brought Trindamir and Ash together because everything about Brom is just a story in some pub. He's the best friend. <laughs> He's, He's the, the best, best friend, friend that got them together. Dude, you know what? I think we leave it there. Uh, we're, so what we'll do... I love bro. Yeah, because this one is a little bit longer than we thought. And also, since the game's coming out next week, I think we can hold off on fate of the game, right? Because it's about to change heavily. Uh, so what yeah. we'll do, probably most likely, is we'll do an episode outside of our standard format and just kind of talk about the release. We'll do a release episode, kind of give our thoughts. That might be fun. Um, and then we'll get back into the regions and give you what you what you expect from the casuals themselves. Uh, but what I won't change is the surprise I ever had. So, oh crap! <laughs> for this episode, this one's a little more tame, right? This one, I mean, it, Poro eggs. So what? <laughs> Poro eggs. What we're talking about is Hedge. You have to say what your favorite egg style is, and what oh. your least favorite egg style is. So I'll go first, as usual, since I'm the guest. Uh, or I'm the host here uh, at this at this torturing <laughs> of Hedge. Uh, my favorite guessed. is scrambled eggs, so nothing nothing surprising there. I think that's the, kind of the general consensus. Uh, it's like the name John Smith. It's kind of expected. Uh, <laughs> um, but my least favorite is sunny side up. Not a fan. Not a wow. fan. I, it's something about. I, so when I was younger, I was always taught about. Like, poisoning oh if you, if you don't cook an egg enough you'll get poisoned like don't eat don't touch the batter or you'll get poisoned um before it's cooked because there's egg in it like egg was like like just dangerous it was as bad as heroin if it was not cooked <laughs> in my household so when i first came across a sunny side up egg probably my teens which is weird enough um i was like no please i don't want any of your your poison style egg <laughs> Uh, scrambled is just kind of a go-to. What about you? Um, so I, I, I'm actually the opposite because, like, if we're talking just strictly like an egg dish, yeah. sunny side up is probably my favorite. Oh man! Um, oh, there goes the like, podcast. <laughs> it's over. That's how they the, broke um, up. So, because my favorite, my favorite thing on the planet yeah. is dipping dipping toast oh my gosh. into warm toast into the yolk oh my God. so like it's it's it has to be wrong. how are you still alive <laughs> how does he do it learn his secrets number six will shock you <laughs> <laughs> um least favorite though i think i think like if i'm truly honest my least favorite way to enjoy an egg would be hard boiled oh okay um, because like the like the yolk at that point is just, you know, a just, marble. It, 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 it's a marble <laughs> that then kind of breaks down into into like molded carpet. Oh no! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it smells um, awful. Yeah. So I I think like just a hard boiled egg uh, technically yeah. would be my least favorite. Okay. I love eggs though, so okay. I I still eat boiled eggs. Yeah. Like I I will eat an egg however you give it to me. Um, I from watching anime yeah. um, specifically the show gintama yeah. their their poor man dish that they do is they take 
a fresh bowl of cooked rice yeah. and crack an egg on top of it. Yeah. And then just soy sauce and mix that up. And I've done it and it's delicious. I I love egg. Okay. So yeah. I'm sorry. So I, we, I will take all the poro eggs. From all me. the poro eggs. And for one more <laughs> poro eggs. And that's been the, this been the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so as always, guys, this one's been a little bit longer, but it's fine. We had a good time. Uh, thank you for listening as always. And we will be back soon with the next episode. Take care. <laughs> Poro X. <eggs. laughs> Poro X. <eggs. laughs>